First show is in Belfast, Northern Ireland. It's at the SSE Arena. And so far, just two fights officially announced. Leah McCourt, the pride of, is she in fact from Belfast? No, she's from Saintfield, Northern Ireland, but pretty darn close. She is going up against Sinead Kavanaugh, second time they fight. And a title fight between Ireland's own uh, Carl Moore, who of course trains out of SPG with the Great coach John Cavanaugh there going up against the veteran Corey Anderson. A big opportunity for Corey to get that title that has eluded him, and he is kind enough to join us right now via the Magic of Zoom. There he is. Hello, Corey. How are you? What's going on, Ari? I'm good. How about yourself? I'm doing really well. Thank you for joining me. I appreciate it. Um, first, uh, if we could take a, a quick step back, what was your reaction when you found out that PFL was acquiring Bellator. Were you excited about this or were you a little bit nervous about what it would mean for you? I mean, I was never really nervous because I know where I rank in the world. So I always felt like no matter what happened, I'm going to have a home or a place somewhere. Uh, my biggest thing was making sure the money wasn't going to be messed up. Uh, that's the first question I asked my manager. I was like, yo, the contract say the same? He's like, yeah, well, if that's the case, I don't care. Wherever we go, I'm going. So just give me a fight. Let's go. Okay. And is that accurate? Did the, did the contract stay the same? Yep, everything stayed the same. So Okay. And, and and when the plans were being put in place for this new year, was there any talk of you going to the PFL? Or or was it just clear, like, Bellator fighters are going to stay with Bellator? Well, that was, a, I don't know if it was an option, but it was something we discussed. Um, he asked me, like, oh, would you, if Bellator wanted you, or PFL wanted to sign you right now, would you go? Like, as long as my contracts stay the same, wherever we go, as long as I'm making my money, that's what it's about. I'm not going to take any less. If we get more, that's great. And uh, so I think there was an option possibly for a little bit to do the tournament this year. And then the opportunity came where I would fight for the title. And like, well, I'd rather get my title than fight in the tournament. Granted, I would make more money if I did a tournament because so many fights in seven months. But the main goal for me is to get the belt, you know, to get the belt and to say I did it. I finally I achieved my goal to win the world title, and then just keep stacking the bread and defend it. Were you surprised that Vadim Nemkov vacated the title to move up to heavyweight? Yes, 100%, especially since the way the first fight ended. Then, yes, he beat me in the second one, but if you, anybody that can be honest with yourself, you saw that first fight, it was yeah. like, it was slippery slope. If I didn't finish you before I told the ref I had butted you, I was probably going to take you down and finish you the next round, because he was pretty much a fish out of water done at that point. So, like, I thought for sure, like a third fight. And why wouldn't you? You make championship money, and now you got to go back and just be a contender. And I know how the contracts work, and I'm sure he's worked the same. If you don't have a title, you don't make nearly as much. So, like I just tell people, I say, why he avoid the fight? And I say, scared money don't make money. So, he didn't want to take the opportunity to risk getting beat the third time. So, he rather just gave up his belt and go fight somebody else. You, re- you really think Vadim Namkov's scared? I think so. I think so, because he did an interview after the fight and then uh, said, well, when they asked him, what did you think about the fight between Corey and Phil? Like, well, I was actually hoping Phil, the translator said he was hoping Phil won or something like that so he can fight Phil the third time. But then when he did an interview and said he didn't want to fight at 205 anymore, he said, well, I feel it's time for me to go to another weight because I've already beat these guys. And I don't want to fight the same guys anymore. There's nothing left I can prove at 205. Like, well, when I beat Phil, you said you wish Phil won so you can fight him a third time. But now, a couple months later, and at the time, Bellator had already talked to both of us and said we was fighting November 18th in Chicago. And uh, they was about to announce it. They told us we're going to announce it on Thursday. This was Monday. Tuesday night, he did an interview saying he was no longer fighting at 205. I was going to go to heavyweight. So it was like, come on, bro. We've been discussing this. They've been talking about the date and where to go for how long now? And now, all of a sudden, the week they're going to announce it, you decide you're going to announce you're not going to fight anymore. Like, and they didn't even know. I talked to everybody. Like, we have no clue. He's never told us any of this. Like, this is news to us, Corey. Like, what the hell? So, uh. And, and so I'm, I'm just curious, like, uh, you mentioned that first fight against him. We're approaching almost two years since that fight went down and you were very close to getting the title. You were close to, uh, I believe it was the finals, right? And, uh, yep. How, how much does that still bother you? Does it does it eat you up inside? Because you were en route to winning that fight. Everyone agrees. I think what bothers me the most is I didn't train the way I should have for the second fight. You know, I mean, if I would have trained the way I did for the first fight, I would have been well more prepared. And uh, in my mind, I was thinking, you know, we shined in the wrestling. 
And like I said, no, I got beat. That's the point. I showed up unprepared. I said every time I lost, what, oh, what happened? I showed up unprepared. That was my fault. And all I did that camp was wrestle. I feel like there's no way he's going to get his wrestling that much better. So I'm going to wrestle. Practice getting down, use my grinding pound, practice positions. And he avoided the takedown the whole fight. And that was all I was prepared for. And, like, even around, I was like, why are you not throwing your hands? Like, man, my hands, they just don't feel like they're there. The one thing I do every camp is go to a boxing gym once a week and box bar or go to a kickbox and just kick only strikes, no takedown. Well, that camp, I didn't box bar one time. All I do, went to MMA, I would throw a jab and take people down and just maul them on the ground, just practice and get my submissions. I was planning on getting my first submission on my uh, career in that title fight. It was going to be iconic for me to get my first submission, win the belt. But I have to get them to the ground first. The thing is, I've always said, plan A don't work. you got to have plan B or plan C. Unfortunately, I was so set on the way that first fight went. I thought for sure, I'm going to take him down. I'm just going to maul him easy early, which is why I shot so early in the fight. Little did I know, he was prepared. He came prepared and defended it. So hats off to him. He was the better fighter tonight, the smarter fighter, because he did what he had to in camp to be prepared for my game. As for me, on the other hand, I didn't challenge myself like I should have. I didn't push myself well, the push myself the way I should have, like I did the first fight, and it cost me my belt. So the second fight bothers you more than the first fight, just because you feel like yes, you the first fight. The first fight sucks. Like my mind yeah. said, why would you say something? That's just how I am. I'm a good sport like that. I don't. It was an honest mistake. I headbutted him, and I didn't know that the ref was gonna just wait, or the doctor was gonna wave it off from the fence because even the ref said we gotta get the doctor here to look at it, at it. But he never even came in the cage. On the outside of the cage, he just waved his hands like the fight is over. Like, yeah, but you didn't even come in and look. Like, it's three seconds left. You can put Vaseline on it right. and let it go to the round, and then you can do it. But nope, you wouldn't let it go on. So I didn't know that was going to happen. If I did, can I say I would not have said anything? I don't know. That's just, like I tell my, my manager and other people, like, I coach college wrestling. So when I tell kids, you always do what's right. Like, you never really try to hurt anybody, but you want to go out there and dominate. But if you do something kind of like own up to what you did, like, it's okay. And that's just what happened. I headbutted him. And I was like, clean shot, keep going. I looked up. I heard him say clean shot. Like, no, it wasn't. Headbutted him. I had no clue he was going to stop the fight right then and there. Right. But, but just communicate. Just like when Mark Henry calls him in the corner. If I hear it or don't hear it, I'm like, ah, oh, it's not there, coach. I just communicate out loud and stuff <laughs> like that. Unfortunately, that night, it cost me. If you're put in the same spot, you do the same thing all over again? I don't know. I think I just keep my mouth shut and then say something after the round ended. Yeah. <laughs> the round is over then. It's like I said, if the three seconds would have ended, I would have been a champ. But the fact I said something with three seconds left, it is what it is now. By the way, uh, when your coach, Mark Henry, one of my favorite people, one of the best people in the game, says something to you in the middle of, of a round and it's not there, like he advised you, you actually say back to him it's not there? Sometimes. Really? If you go back in the back fight, you'll see um, well, it was actually there. And I said it to him. There's two fights in France that like you can see on camera. The Bader fight, the first combo Bader threw, we knew he was going to do He's going to throw the jab. He's going to put, he pushes the jab with his head out. You hear Mark say, it's there. And I say, I see it. <laughs> and the next time he throw, I hit him with the overhand and put him out. That was the code. He throw the jab. We go to overhand over the top. Okay, leave his chin up. Follow with an uppercut, uppercut and a cross. And then the Pat Cummings fight, with um, him and Ricardo was screaming, get the hook, get the hooks. I say, I'm trying, but I can't hook his leg. <laughs> it's like, I just do that in practice. When coach is talking to me, if I can't hear him, I'll be on top. Or if I am got taken down, I'm like, say it louder. I can't hear you. So they know. Like, I'm listening. Or Mark is like, throw the jab to such and such. I'm like, it's not there. Like, that happened this weekend, actually. He's telling me, so I'm like, it's not there. Like, yes, it is. Then we look back on camera, like, oh, it was there. You're right. I mean, I just always been a communicator like that. Even when I wrestle, I don't know. That's something I do. After the second Nemkov fight, did you think potentially that you would never get another chance at a title? Uh, to be honest, I don't know. I think that Phil Davis fight, I've said in interviews, that was the most nervous I've ever been going really? into a fight. I remember that was the first time I had Frankie in the corner. I remember talking to Frankie in the back, like, yo, I, like that whole day I thought I had COVID or something. They came in my room, my room was turned up to like 90 something degrees. Everybody, like, why is it hot in here? Like, y'all hot? I'm freezing. Like, I was so scared. I think the nerves. Emmy was thinking, like, I either, I'm going to win this fight and possibly get a shot, or they're going to go another way, or if I lose this fight, I'm never getting another title shot. So I think the nerves of that just had me so worked up and so anxious and so, like, I was nauseous. I, it was the worst feeling I ever had. 
like just that whole day. Like I was so prepared all camp, but then when fight day came, I had never felt that stickly in my life. Like wow. it was bad, but I don't know. I think I don't know. Part of my mind, I think it was thinking if we lost, we definitely wasn't getting another one. And if we won, since we both had just recently fought them, they might go another way. So it was kind of unanswered what was going to happen. And so here you are. And, and uh, that fight was in June, I believe, right? So it's almost been a year since your last fight. Mm -hmm. Has that been frustrating? Uh, like I told my wife, I always said when she was bothering me, when are they going to fight again? Are they going to call you? What's going to happen next? Do you know? Are they saying anything? I just always say, yo, chill. God got us regardless. Okay. Like I'm a hustler. We ain't never going to go broke. The whole time we was out, I got a hunting show, a YouTube channel, a hunting show. I get paid doing that. Like, I'm just going to hit the road. I'm going to be traveling, doing a lot of hunts, getting this money. I'm going to get the paper. We're going to make sure the bills are getting paid. We got money in the bank. If we had to stop fighting today, we good. We'll open the gym. Like, I ain't stressing it. Whatever happens, God got a plan. So just relax. Calm down. <laughs> like, yes, I wanted to stay active. I wanted to fight. Like I said, I coach college wrestling. So season started. I was with those kids. Hunting season was in. I was out hunting getting my content, filming, doing stuff with my partners, getting money that way. So it was not frustrating, but at the same time, I was hoping it happened sooner or later because I didn't want to get to that point where father time, you know what I mean? You can only stay young for so long and the aches and injuries start adding up. And then you get a fight and you banged up. It, was, it came at the right time, you know? It came at the right time. We're still healthy, still feeling good, still going hard, so... It came at the right time. Like I said, God got us, and he just he answered at the right time. What's the hunting show? Like, what what, what what do you do on there? So I got a channel called Outdoors with Overtime, and I travel. Like, most of my hunts, I do with a bow. So I got big Whoa. in the archery. I got two bow shops. I build my own bows. Uh, build bows for other people. I do, like, product reviews on there. I travel the country or go out of the country. I've been to Canada, uh, Vancouver Island, hunting whitetail and all this stuff, different stuff. Anything you can kill in season, I'm going to eat. I go out, I kill it, and show how I track it, and bring it back, process it, and just just show the thrills of outdoors. And that's another side of me a lot of people don't know. Like, people see me at the bow shop, I'm like, wait, you're Corey Anderson a fighter, right? Like, yeah. Like, wait, you hunt? That's what I love to do. Like, I'm in the woods more than I'm in the gym, to be honest. I just love being outdoors. So, after the OSP fight, I really got big into it, and uh, somebody hit me up. One of the producers from Tough, like, yo, you should start a sh hunting show, man. You could be good because there's not many black people in the industry. And I did it. I ordered a camera off of Amazon and been doing it ever since. So I do it all myself. All my own editing, my filming. Wow. And post everything. So like I said, overtime is more than just fighting. It's just I'm always doing something and keeping the money coming because I'm a hustler. That's just how I am. And by the way, why do you use a bow and arrow as opposed to, I guess, a, a gun, right? Like, why? why? Yeah, more challenging. I uh -huh. can get a gun. Like I do, when I go to Texas, I do veteran hunts once a year. I donate my time to these veteran hunts and go out with them. And then we do guns because those guys are big in the gun. But on my own dime, I'd rather a bow because with the bow, kind of like martial arts, if you're not prepared, if you're not practicing, if you're not trained for it, you're not going to get a kill. You That deer has to come within 20 to 30 yards. Well, deer, they see with their nose before they see with their eyes. And they nose they can smell for hundreds and hundreds of yards. So if you don't have the right wind or you making too much movement or you making too much noise, they're going to see you way before you see them. So the fact that, especially if somebody my size and stature, when I get into a tree stand, I'm 20 feet up or whatever, 15, 10, however high up I am, I got to be still and stealthy and make sure I can trick that deer to think he's safe to come around here and somehow walk right underneath my stand within 20 yards to get a shot with an arrow. It's the most ethical way you can kill an animal and to see them go down and process it and it's, it just make you feel good when it's all over said and done. It's a drill and rush like fighting. You're like Robin Hood out there with the bow and arrow. Yeah. I got my man Frankie put on the shoot and the bow. Him. Got a couple other fighters that want to try it. I just got to get him to the woods. He can give you a, a full breakdown when he do his first time because I've been doing it my whole life. So it's like, to me, it's kind of like just a way of life. But I would love to get Frankie out there and shoot one and let him break it down to like how like even shooting the boat, he says, it's like something crazy. It's so fun. You're like, it's peaceful and it's so exciting. Then when you kill a deer, it's just a whole different story. It's just you providing food for your family with a bow and arrow at 20 yards to a deer that's supposed or animal is not supposed to be able to get that close to people without getting scared. But you tricked them into doing it. You figured out how to get him to come in front of you and 
get that perfect shot and everything. It's just I can go all day about hunting. Let's not even talk about that. Okay, we can go all, right. all day. I was just curious who taught who taught you how to do the bow and arrow thing. So me and my father actually started when I was 12, 13 years old. My freshman year in high school, it was a bow shop that got put in up the road from my house, and we was leaving the store or something and saw it. We went in there, and uh, we just used to do it for target hunting and the, or target shooting. And when I was 16, one day after football practice, a teammate of mine, I told him I was going to shoot with my dad, and he told me you can hunt with a bow, and I had no clue. He took me out for the first time, and I killed my first one. By the time I was like 22, it took me forever. So from 16 to 22... It took me to kill a deer. I mean, that's just how hard it is if you don't know what you're doing. And after that, I've been hooked. It's been on it since. I'm 34 now, and if I'm not in the gym, I'm out shooting my bow or in the woods. That's my passion. Okay, back to the other passion, fighting. How much did you know about Carl Moore before they, they, they offered him to you? So I've only seen him recently because he fought Alex Polizzi, who's a buddy of my Oh, We're acquainted. We grew up in kids' club wrestling together. And then we went to different high schools. So as kids, we used to wrestle together all the time. And I would go out to Vegas, and we reunited again out there at Extreme Couture, and we would train. And uh, I was out there the second NEMCOF fight, and he was telling me that he might be fighting Carl Moore the next year, blase, blase. And then he had, and I was watching film on him and studying on him then, and then he fought the same day I fought Phil Davis. That's when him and Alex finally fought. So since then, I've seen little bits and pieces of him. I didn't, like, watch him like I am now, but I knew who he was, and I was aware of him. Was I aware that he was going to be the next guy to get a title shot? I didn't think that far ahead, but I had an eye on him that night, especially after he beat Alex, because, okay, well, he's working his way up, so he could be one of the guys we can fight someday. I didn't know it was going to be the next fight. Are, are you uh, impressed with him? I mean, obviously, he hasn't been around as long as you. Solid record in Bellator. What do you make of him? He's actually been around longer than me. I think he debuted the year before I debuted. Is that true? I think. Way less, way yeah, less fights I'll, than you. I'll, 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 he started in 2012. He's 12 and 2. Uh, did he? Did he? Uh, start? He took a long absence. He took like three, oh, four years yeah, off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, fair enough. Okay, well, less fights under his uh, under his belt, but that's fair. That's fair. You, and your your debut yeah. was back. I mean, he got fights. Yeah, he got fights. You're right. You're right. My bad. But uh, yeah, he's not no one to look, overlook. By any means, he's uh, he's kind of well-rounded. You see his fights, he's more of a striker. He'd rather strike with you and be in southpaw, you know, it's like everybody say. It's easier for a southpaw to get, get looks because most of the time southpaws train with orthodox guys, and the orthodox guy is hard to get the southpaw guy. So he's always just putting that jab out there, trying to lead you to step into his cross. And, uh, yeah, I feel like in his earlier years, he was more combo-oriented, fast-moving, Hitting combos, not throwing so much power, but now he's like slowed down his output, but putting more power onto his shots, trying to hurt you with each shot. Um, he can cage wrestle a little bit, got pretty decent cage wrestling defense, and on the ground he's got submissions. So he's got that, and I don't have any submissions. So, I mean, he's a well-rounded mixed martial artist. So when I look at it. You win this fight on March 22nd. Are you the best light heavyweight in the world? I already believe I'm like best light heavyweight in the world. People are gonna say whatever you want to say. I believe it every day. That's the only way I can get up and keep doing this thing. I believe so hardly I'm the best. I lost my opportunity to prove it against Nimkov, but it is what it is. And they're gonna say, well, to you nine UFC, you can never say you're the best. So you can say what you want to say. <laughs> belief is belief. I believe it and I know it. Because I've trained with some of the best. I've trained with Magomed Ankala. Like like I said when I did the interview, he, me and him, I think two best light heavyweights in the world. That dude is dangerous. And we go out and we go, we have rounds. We have good rounds. Like, I love going with Maga. He's a tough guy. I'm a tough guy. And it's not like anybody that's mulling over each other. It's actually good work. And I know for a fact, I know for a fact, like, I am the best, if not one of the best. Like I said, me and Maga, the top two. We've never actually fought each other, but we have wars when we spar. And I believe, holy, he's the best other than me. And that's just what he did. He had a great win uh, last month, but obviously there's Alex Pereira, and you know I know you and Jamal were going back and forth. You guys good now, or uh, agree to disagree? In my last post, I said like I, people. Oh, he said something about uh, you would never be this and that. And what you think about me? Like, bro, I don't even think about you. I didn't even say your name. That's the reason why he came in my my inbox or whatever. I did an interview and didn't mention him as one of the top light heavyweights, so he clapped back. He got offended because I didn't mention him. Like. 
He don't even cross my mind on my radar. Like, congrats, you got the belt. You beat a guy for the belt that I dominated on a week and a half notice. And you got cut up and beat up by him a little bit. So that's what that's what you bragging on? I was like, say what you want to say. We beat the same people. You knocked out Johnny Walker, I knocked out Johnny Walker. Just because you got the belt don't mean nothing. I say to this day, the 205 division in, like, in the UFC ain't what it used to be. It's top guys out there. And like I said, Jamal got that belt when Ratchet, Ankala, and Jan Block, which all hurt. I think all three of those guys are there now. But they was all out at the time when he got the call. So, dude, you didn't he didn't beat anybody, and I said that, and he got mad. I didn't even say he didn't beat anybody. I just said the light heavyweight division wasn't that good, and he got mad. <laughs> so, that's on him. I don't have any thoughts on him at all. Uh, fair enough. Uh, and, and so I'm, I'm just wondering if it ever annoys you, because you maybe do the greatest things in Bellator, but there's always like this stigma Oh, if you're not doing it in the UFC, even if the competition is tougher, but maybe not as well known, does that ever get to you? Do you ever get frustrated by this? Why would it? I was in the UFC. Everybody seen what I did. Like I said, I beat those people. The people I beat, let's put it this way, I would beat people that I should get a title fight for, and they're like, oh, no, you got to get more. Then somebody else come up and beat that same person. Like, oh, he gets a title fight. Oh, that was a great win. Like, hold on, when I did it, the guy was lackluster, or he was old, like when I beat Glover. Oh, he was washed up. That's why Corey Anderson beat him, and he don't deserve a title shot. Then everybody else be like, oh, he gets a title fight. Like, get the f- out of here. So it got to the point where I left. It was like, no matter what you do, people are going to have an opinion. It's just how you feel about that opinion. And I really don't care about that opinion because I know who I beat, and I know who I can beat, and I know what I can do. Let these naysayers say what they're going to say. I'm at peace with what I'm doing. I'm out here. I'm making money. I'm taking care of my family now. We live in life. We got two houses. We got land. We got whatever we want to do. I'm fine with that. It went from the point of chasing a gold belt to prove I was the best in the the biggest organization that's been promoted the most, which is why UFC is the biggest, to now I'm making my worth and making money, having fun, doing what I love to do. And I wake up every day just blessed. So the people can say what they say. I wake up. I live my life. You worried about what I'm doing. Me and my family, we eating. Know that. Okay. Just know that. Um, and, and last thing for you before I let you go, just curious, I know you haven't been to fight week yet, so maybe it's hard to say, but so far, does it feel like same old Bellator? I know Kogan is still around, so I know a lot of the fighters are happy about that, but do you feel any difference with the organization or is it too early to really tell now that there's new ownership? I mean, it's like you said, it's kind of a little early to say, but the communication factor is there for me. That was another big thing I loved about Bellator. When I had a question, I reached out to Kogan or, CJ, anybody there, and they get back to me right away. So that was always big on me. Nobody ever left me hanging out in the breeze trying to find my own answers. So I still had that communication key. It seemed like a lot of the same people I worked with came over, and they messaged me, contacted me when I got questions or sending me the paperwork, whatever I need, and everything is smooth. So right now, I'm a happy camper. Everything seems to be the same. The same people I love working with, I'm, I hate that Scott didn't come. Like I messaged him and said when he, they said he wasn't coming over, or whatever they said, like, yeah, I just want to say thank you for everything you did. Because it wasn't for you make, taking an opportunity on me, I wouldn't have the life I have now. I guess UFC got me the picture, and everybody knows who Corey Anderson is. But Scott Coker and Bellator gave me the life. I made that post before, and I'll say it again. Like, he took an opportunity on somebody who just got knocked out, got me over here. And I went in there and proved my worth, and then got another big contract. And now, now it's just like, now my family is kind of set. Like I said, if we didn't fight again right now. We won't bat an eye. Like, we go to the banker, tell him we need this much out to start a gym, need this to invest in that. Like, the money is there. And that's all because Scott Coker, Mike Coker, and Bellator MMA and what they did for me. Mm-hmm. I'm forever thankful for that. I'll never say a bad thing about anybody from the Bellator. Well, it's going to be a fun scene next month, right? Because Carl's from Ireland, close by. Uh, you're going to be in enemy territory. But those are the fun fights, right? Those crowds are always amazing. So I'm sure you're relishing that. It's going to be fun. It's great to have it back. Uh, good luck to you, Corey. Thank you for coming on. I really do appreciate it. And uh, good luck in training. And then, of course, next month as you try to finally get that belt. Thanks for watching. We appreciate it very much. Hey, if you like this video, give us the old thumbs up. Subscribe as well. You can get many more of these videos on the channel. So please do that. We would love you forever if you did so.